So I'm going to start my talk by showing you a brief video. Here we go. Well, hello, ladies. I'm Jon Koyman. I'm a famous actor from Holland. <laughs> What the hell are you doing, son? You can't win a war with this! Oh. Go ready. Okay, um, so why did I show you this video? Because, uh, first of all, what was that? That was an advertisement that was released in the Netherlands uh, almost two years ago to promote a specific brand of barbecue sauce. Yet, what we saw seemed to be everything but uh, the celebration of the qualities of this product, right? We saw many references to masculinity, to virility, to ideas of, of war, of violence. We saw almost like a sort of primordial sense of hunting, also sexual. We saw this soldier that was flirting pretty unsuccessfully with these two pretty ladies. And we even saw Rambo at the end, who had the punchline, if you want to be a man, eat like a man. And why did I show you this clip? Because it captures really well one of the focuses of my research. Um, this clip showed us that when we talk about meat, we are not just talking about a bunch of proteins. We are just actually evoking a set of symbols and meaning that go far beyond the plate. So precisely, we are evoking a sense of competition, of violence, of masculinity and virility. And this is exactly the focus of my research at the moment. I am an art curator, and uh, I believe that art, design, and all forms of creative expressions provide really powerful tools to better understand the reality in which we live. And uh, specifically, uh, when I say better understand, I don't mean that art and design can give us ultimate answers, but rather they can give us the tools to pose the right questions and navigate better complex dynamics in which uh, we live and that uh, consist and constitute our reality. And the focus of my research at the moment is on the cultural implications uh, that derive from the introduction of cultured meat. So cultured meat uh, is meat that is produced in vitro by growing animal cells as opposed to slaughtering animals for human consumptions. And I am looking specifically at how the introduction of cultured meat in our diets, which might happen in a few years, will not just change quite radically our way of uh, in providing food for ourselves, but actually might have a much broader, much more deep impact in our life. In the way specifically we look at our relationship with other living organisms, and so by extension, by the way we look at life uh, in general. But let's go uh, in order, let's proceed in order. What is cultured meat from a scientific point of view? As I mentioned before, is a way of um, growing animal cells, so it's a form of cellular agriculture, which relies heavily on uh, techniques, uh, tissue engineering techniques, that are usually uh, employed in regen regenerative medicine. So this sounds super, super complex, but in fact, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, everything starts uh, with a tiny biopsy. So uh, some a little portion of, of a cow is taken, which has muscles inside it. And these muscles contain so-called stem cells, specifically muscular, uh, skeletal muscle uh, stem cells. And these cells have the capacity to divide and multiply at an incredible rate. So from one single cell, it is possible in a pretty fast manner to obtain up to 100 trillion stem cells, which means approximately 10,000 kilos of meat. So from one tiny biopsy to an incredible amount of meat. 
And the interesting thing is that the process is pretty simple. So it's enough for scientists to provide uh, an environment where these cells can grow, and obviously they need to feed them as well. But then the cells kind of like do the jobs themselves alone. And uh, why is it uh, interesting? Uh, because it, the promise behind it is that of offering an alternative which is sustainable, environmentally sustainable, but also viable from an economical point of view, to traditional ways of uh, consuming meat, which imply the slaughtering of animals. The person that you see here, Mark Post, is a professor of uh, vascular uh, physiology at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. You see him here uh, in the background of some beautiful uh, skeletal muscle cells, which are the ones that I was mentioning before. And you see him here biting on the first burger in Metro ever produced. So Mark Post was the person that already in 2013, so already a few years ago, introduced to the public the first proof of concept for cultured meat. Uh, quite interestingly, when he introduced this product to the public, he also organized the tasting, because obviously like the first question people usually ask is, what is the taste of it? And it seems that the taste is there. Already in 2013, the taste was pretty much identical to the taste of animal meat. What was lacking there, and what now scientists are trying to improve, is the consistency, the kind of texture of animal meat that nowadays cultured meat still doesn't have. And this is because uh, cells that are grown in a petri dish just grow horizontally. So they lack the kind of like three-dimensional quality that gives uh, animal meat the, the consistency that, that, we are, that we know. And so now scientists are experimenting with all sorts of very creative, creative materials, including silk, in order to replicate a structure, in order to create a scaffolding on which cells can grow. But regardless of these technical details, what is really interesting, as I mentioned, is that cultured meat seem to offer a viable solution to rethink the way we supply uh, animal products for our society. And as we know, uh, animal products, uh, slaughtering animals to provide food for ourselves is highly problematic, first of all, from an ethical point of view, which I am not really going to talk about now, but we all are aware of. Uh, but also, consuming animal meat poses many problems for the environment, which is actually something I am going to elaborate a little bit more on. So uh, I could mention uh, and quote uh, hundreds or thousands of data, but I'm just going to give you two numbers that are pretty telling of how bad uh, and dire the situation is for the environment when it comes to uh, extensive farming. Um, so 18% of the greenhouse uh, gases emissions that we produce derive from uh, extensive farming. Not just that, but 70% of arable land in our planet is used for extensive farming. So pretty telling and quite scary data, I believe. Here you get a sense of the scope and the magnitude of, of the phenomenon. You see on your left hand side um, how many animals were slaughtered worldwide in 2011. And inside on your right hand side you see how strong and big the impact of, in terms of greenhouse uh, um, uh, gases emissions is for the production of one single kilo of meat. The thing is that if the situation is pretty worrisome now, things are not likely to get better in the future. On the contrary, as you see from these two graphs, the way uh, meat is produced and consumed nowadays in, is unequally distributed worldwide. So there are countries in which meat is consumed less than in other countries. Um, the thing is that there are areas in, of the world, including China, some parts of Africa, uh, some parts of South America and, and, and uh, Russia, in which there, are, uh, there is a growing middle class uh, that is demanding more meat, uh, for whom consuming meat as a value of a status symbol. And, and this means that uh, with a growing population, with a population that worldwide is growing from seven to nine billion people, by 2050, the demand for meat is likely to double. So we simply cannot keep doing things as we are doing now. Here you see actually how um, 
the, the, the way meat is consumed worldwide is unequally distributed. So if in countries like the United States and the UK, the consumption of meat has pretty much remained the same for the past six years, in countries like China, uh, it has actually skyrocketed in the past years. So now, an average Chinese person consumes 20 times meat more than it was in 1961. So just to give you a sense of the perspective that we are facing. So what are the alternatives? According to some people, the solution to this issue is just to stop eating meat altogether. So we should all become vegetarian. That would be ideal. Uh, that would be highly desirable. It still doesn't seem to be very realistic. Uh, in post-industrial societies like ours, the average percentage of vegetarian people is between 3 and 5%. And this percentage has pretty much remained the same for the past 35 years. So it's not likely that vegetarianism will offer a viable solution, at least in the short term. And that's where precisely cultured meat comes into play. Because cultured meat really offers us the opportunity to rethink the way we supply animal products for our society. And it offers the promise of, of giving us uh, more sustainable and, and, and uh, viable um, products for, for consumption, for, for our societal consumptions. And uh, so I hope I have given you a sort of overview of how uh, interesting and kind of crucial this topic is. And I hope I have also kind of conveyed how many fields of our life this topic touches upon. Uh, there are economical implications, there are social implications, but there are also cultural implications, which are the ones that I'm actually more interested in as a curator. So just to give you a sense of the kind of questions that I ask myself every day, I have selected three, which I will kind of like launch to you as, as kind of inspiration or prompt. The first topic, the first line of research that I really fi find fascinating is the one that has to do with the way in which cultured meat has an impact in the so-called natural versus non-natural debate. So the kind of semiotics or semantics of the natural versus the non-natural. So when people that deal with cultured meat think about introducing it in our uh, in, our, in our markets, in our supermarkets, which again might happen in the near future, they ask themselves, how will the public react? And many people are worried that the public will react with a sense of the mistrust, with a sense of kind of disgust perhaps even. And this is because something that is produced in a lab is perceived as artificial, as less natural than something that already exists in reality. The problem is, the paradox, the paradox is that most of the meat that we consume come from extensive farming, which actually relies on incredible amounts of antibiotics to raise the animal. So the open question is, what is more or less natural? Something that is grown in a lab under very controlled uh, conditions, or an animal that is substantially drugged? That's the first question. Another line of research that I'm really interested in has to do with the entire debate that was really big a few years ago uh, regarding how to call this new product that I'm now referring to as cultured meat. Uh, so there were many options back in the days on the plate. There was Frankenstein meat, there was meat in vitro, there was V-meat, and then eventually people settled on cultured meat because they thought it offered a good balance. It was descriptive enough to describe the actual object, but also had this neutral, unbiased quality to it. And I find it very interesting because it kind of, A, implies that the language that we use has a very strong impact in the way we perceive reality. But also, this entire debate made me think about some of the meanings and symbols that were evoked by the advertisement we rumble we saw before. So the open question in this case is, can a product that we refer to in such a neutral way, cultured meat, evoke the same set of meanings and symbols that natural animal meat, sorry, evoke, that we saw uh, very, very well portrayed in the advertisement with Rambo. Then finally, uh, my third um, line of research has to do with the way in which cultured meat 
enters in the tension between, that is oftentimes perceived between new technologies and traditions. So there are many places uh, in which there are recipes that are highly uh, important for people's identity, but that are also basically a disaster for the environment. And I'm thinking about whale in some part of North Europe or Japan, or uh, shark fin soup, for example. These recipes, because they are so uh, harm, much harming the environment, uh, are, are likely to disappear with time. Whereas cultured meat, in that sense, might offer the option of maintaining alive ancient traditions that otherwise will die. Thank you.